Have you heard? It's all the rage. The wit, the sense, the, the jokes. jokes. I chortled. I guffawed. I laughed until I choked. Put down your cell phone, turn off the Xbox, just for a short while. And join us for something your great-grandmother might have laughed at, or perhaps blushed at, hmm? From famous authors to long-lost gems, Edwardian Entertainments explores the short stories of a past century, wherever they may be found. Tonight's story is Luella Miller by Mary E. Wilkins Freeman, performed and mastered by Julie Hoverson. Luella Miller by Mary E. Wilkins Freeman As first published in Everybody's Magazine in December 1902 Close to the village street stood the one-story house in which Luella Miller, who had an evil name in the village, had dwelt. She had been dead for years, yet there were those in the village who, in spite of the clearer light which comes on a vantage point from a long past danger, half believed in the tale which they had heard from their childhood. In their hearts, although they scarcely would have owned it, was a survival of the wild horror and frenzied fear of their ancestors who had dwelt in the same age with Luella Miller. Young people even would stare with a shudder at the old house as they passed, and children never played around it as was their wont around an untenanted building. Not a window in the old Miller house was broken. The panes reflected the morning sunlight in patches of emerald and blue, and the latch of the sagging front door was never lifted, although no bolt secured it. Since Luella Miller had been carried out of it, the house had had no tenant except one friendless old soul who had no choice between that and the far-off shelter of the open sky. This old woman, who had survived her kindred and friends, lived in the house one week, and then one morning no smoke came out of the chimney, and a body of neighbors, a score strong, entered and found her dead in her bed. There were dark whispers as to the cause of her death, and there were those who testified to an expression of fear so exalted that it showed forth the state of the departing soul upon the dead face. The old woman had been hale and hearty when she entered the house, and in seven days she was dead. It seemed that she had fallen a victim to some uncanny power. The minister talked in the pulpit with covert severity against the sin of superstition. Still the belief prevailed. Not a soul in the village but would have chosen the almshouse rather than that dwelling. No vagrant, if he heard the tale, would seek shelter beneath that old roof, unhallowed by nearly half a century of superstitious fear. There was only one person in the village who had actually known Luella Miller. That person was a woman well over 80, but a marvel of vitality and unextinct youth. Straight as an arrow, with the spring of one recently let loose from the bow of life, she moved about the streets, and she always went to church, rain or shine. She had never married, and had lived alone for years in a house across the road from Luella Miller's. This woman had none of the garrulousness of age, but never in all her life had she ever held her tongue for any will save her own, and she never spared the truth when she essayed to present it. She it was who bore testimony to the life, evil though possibly wittingly or designedly so, of Luella Miller, and to her personal appearance. When this old woman spoke, and she had the gift of description, although her thoughts were clothed in the rude vernacular of her native village, one could seem to see Luella Miller as she had really looked. According to this woman, Lydia Anderson by name, Luella Miller had been a beauty of a type rather unusual in New England. She had been a slight, pliant sort of creature, as ready with a strong yielding to fate and as unbreakable as a willow. She had glimmering lengths of straight, fair hair, which she wore softly looped round a long, lovely face. She had blue eyes full of soft pleading, little, slender, clinging hands, and a wonderful grace of motion and attitude. 
Luella Miller used to sit in a way nobody else could if they sat up and studied a week of Sundays, said Lydia Anderson. And it was a sight to see her walk. If one of them willows over there on the edge of the brook could start up and get its roots free of the ground and move off, it would go just the way Luella Miller used to. She had a green shot silk she used to wear, too, and a hat with green ribbon streamers and a lace veil blowing across her face and out sideways and a green ribbon flying from her waist. That was what she came out bride in when she married Erastus Miller. Her name before she was married was Hill. There always was a side of L's in her name, married or single. Erastus Miller, he was good looking too, better looking than Luella. Sometimes I used to think that Luella weren't so handsome after all. Erastus just about worshipped her. I used to know him pretty well. He lived next door to me, and we went to school together. Folks used to say he was waiting on me, but he weren't. I never thought he was, except once or twice when he said things that some girls might have suspected meant something. That was before Luella came here to teach the district school. It was funny how she came to get it, for folks said she hadn't any education, and that one of the big girls, Lottie Henderson, used to do all the teaching for her, while she sat back and did embroidery work on a cambric pocket handkerchief. Lottie Henderson was a real smart girl, a splendid scholar, and she just set her eyes by Luella, as all the girls did. Lottie would have made a real smart woman, but she died when Luella had been here about a year. Just faded away and died. Nobody knew what aided her. She dragged herself to that schoolhouse and helped Luella teach till the very last minute. The committee all knew how Luella didn't do much of the work herself, but they winked at it. It weren't long after Lottie died that Erastus married her. I always thought he hurried it up because she weren't fit to teach. One of the big boys used to help her after Lottie died, but he hadn't much government and the school didn't do very well, and Luella might have had to give it up, for the committee couldn't have shut their eyes to things much longer. The boy that helped her was a real honest, innocent sort of fella, and he was a good scholar, too. Folks said he overstudied, and that was the reason he took crazy the year after Luella married, but I don't know. And I don't know what made Erastus Miller go into consumption of the blood the year after he was married. Consumption wasn't in his family. He just grew weaker and weaker, and went almost bent double when he tried to wait on Luella, and he spoke feeble like an old man. He worked terrible hard till the last, trying to save up a little to leave Luella. I've seen him out in the worst storms on a wood sled. He used to cut and sell wood, and he was hunched up on top looking more dead and alive. Once I couldn't stand it, I went over and helped him pitch some wood on the cart. I was always strong in my arms. I wouldn't stop for all he told me to, and I guess he was glad enough for the help. That was only a week before he died. He fell on the kitchen floor while he was getting breakfast. He always got the breakfast and let Luella lay a bed. He did all the sweeping and the washing and the ironing and most of the cooking. He couldn't bear to have Luella lift her finger, and she let him do for her. She lived like a queen for all the work she did. She didn't even do her sewing. She said it made a shoulder ache to sew, and poor Erastus' sister Lily used to do all her sewing. She wasn't able to either. She was never strong in her back, but she did it beautifully. She had to, to suit Luella. She was so dreadful particular. I never saw anything like the faggoting and hemstitching that Lily Miller did for Luella. She made all Luella's wedding outfit and that green silk dress after Maria Babbitt cut it. Maria said she cut it for nothing, and she did a lot more cutting and fitting for nothing for Luella, too. Lily Miller went to live with Luella after Erastus died. She gave up her home, though she was real attached to it, and went am I afraid to stay alone. She rented it, and she went to live with Luella right away after the funeral. Then this old woman, Lydia Anderson, who remembered Luella Miller, would go on to relate the story of Lily Miller. It seemed that on the removal of Lily Miller to the house of her dead brother to live with his widow, the village people first began to talk. This Lily Miller had been hardly past her first youth, and a most robust and blooming woman, rosy-cheeked with curls of strong black hair overshadowing round, candid temples and bright, dark eyes. 
It was not six months after she had taken up her residence with her sister-in-law that her rosy color faded and her pretty curves became wan hollows. White shadows began to show in the black rings of her hair, and the light died out of her eyes. Her features sharpened, and there were pathetic lines at her mouth, which yet wore always an expression of utter sweetness and even happiness. She was devoted to her sister. There was no doubt that she loved her with her whole heart, and was perfectly content in her service. It was her sole anxiety lest she should die and leave her alone. The way Lily Miller used to talk about Luella was enough to make you mad and enough to make you cry, said Lydia Anderson. I've been in there sometimes, toward the last, when she was too feeble to cook and carried her some blancmange or custard or something I thought she might relish, and she'd thank me, and when I asked her how she was, say she felt better than she did yesterday, and asked me if I didn't think she looked better. Dreadful pitiful and say poor Luella had an awful time taking care of her and doing the work she weren't strong enough to do anything, when all the time Luella weren't lifting her finger, and poor Lily didn't get any care except what the neighbors gave her, and Luella eat up everything that was carried in for Lily. I had it real straight that she did. Luella used to just sit and cry and do nothing. She did act real fond of Lily, and she pined away considerable, too. There was those that thought she'd go into a decline herself. But after Lily died, her aunt, Abby Mixter, come. And then Luella picked up and grew as fat and rosy as ever. But poor Aunt Abby began to droop just the way Lily had. And I guess somebody wrote to her married daughter, Mrs. Sam Abbott, who lived in Bar, for she wrote her mother that she must leave right away and come make her a visit. But Aunt Abby wouldn't go. I can see her now. She was a real good-looking woman, tall and large, with a big square face and a high forehead that looked of itself kind of benevolent and good. She just tended out on Luella as if she had been a baby, and when her married daughter sent for her, she wouldn't stir one inch. She'd always thought a lot of her daughter, too, but she said Luella needed her, and her married daughter didn't. Her daughter kept writing and writing, but it didn't do any good. Finally, she came, and when she saw how bad her mother looked, she broke down and cried, and all but went on her knees to have her come away. She spoke her mind out to Luella, too. She told her that she'd killed her husband and everybody that had anything to do with her, and she'd thank her to leave her mother alone. Luella went into hysterics, and Aunt Abby was so frightened that she called me after her daughter went. Mrs. Sam Abbott said she went away fairly crying out loud in the buggy. The neighbors heard her, and well she might, for she never saw her mother again alive. I went in that night when Aunt Abby called for me, standing in the door with her little green checked shawl over her head. I can see her now. Do come over here, Miss Anderson, she sung out, kind of gasping for breath. I didn't stop for anything. I put over as fast as I could, and when I got there, there was Luella laughing and crying altogether, and Aunt Abby trying to hush her, and all the time she was herself as white as a sheet and shaken so she could hardly stand. For the land's sakes, Mrs. Mixter, says I, you look worse than she does. You ain't fit to be up out of your bed. Oh, there ain't anything the matter with me, says she. Then she went on talking to Luella. There, there, don't, don't, poor little lamb, says she. Aunt Abby is here. She ain't going away and leave you. Don't, poor little lamb. Do leave her with me, Mrs. Mixter, and you get back to bed, says I, for Aunt Abby had been laying down considerable lately, though somehow she contrived to do the work. I'm well enough, says she. Don't you think she had better have the doctor, Miss Anderson? The doctor, says I. I think you better have the doctor. I think you need him much worse than some folks I could mention. And I looked right straight at Luella Miller laughing and crying and going on as if she was the center of all creation. All the time she was acting so, seemed as if she was too sick to sense anything, she was keeping a sharp lookout as to how we took it out of the corner of one eye. I see her. You could never cheat me about Luella Miller. Finally, I got real mad, and I ran home and got a bottle of valerian I had. And I poured some boiling hot water on a handful of catnip, and I mixed up that catnip tea with most half a wine glass of valerian, and I went over with it to Luella's. I marched right up to Luella, holding out that cup, all smoking. Now, says I, Luella Miller, you swallow this. What is... 
what is it? Oh, what is it? She sort of screeches out. Then she goes off a laughing enough to kill. Poor lamb, poor little lamb, says Aunt Abby, standing over her, all kind of tottery, and trying to bathe her head with camphor. You swallow this right down, says I. And I didn't waste any ceremony. I just took hold of Luella Miller's chin and I tipped her head back and I caught her mouth open with laughing and I clapped that cup to her lips and I fairly hollered at her, swallow, swallow, swallow. And she gulped it right down. She had to, and I guess it did her good. Anyhow, she stopped crying and laughing and let me put her to bed. And she went to sleep like a baby inside of half an hour. That was more than poor Aunt Abby did. She lay awake all that night, and I stayed with her, though she tried not to have me. Said she weren't sick enough for watches, but I stayed. And I made some good cornmeal gruel, and I fed her a teaspoon every little while all night long. It seemed to me as if she was just dying from being all wore out. In the morning, as soon as it was light, I run over to the Bisbees and sent Johnny Bisbee for the doctor. I told him to tell the doctor to hurry, and he come pretty quick. Poor Aunt Abby didn't seem to know much of anything when he got there. You couldn't hardly tell she breathed. She was so used up. When the doctor had gone, Luella came into the room looking like a baby in her ruffled nightgown. I could see her now. Her eyes were as blue and her face all pink and white like a blossom. And she looked at Aunt Abby in the bed sort of innocent and surprised. Why, says she, Aunt Abby ain't got up yet? No, she ain't, says I, pretty short. I thought I didn't smell the coffee, says Luella. Coffee, says I. I guess if you have coffee this morning, you'll make it yourself. I never made the coffee in all my life, says she, dreadful astonished. Erastus always made the coffee as long as he lived, and then Lily, she made it, and then Aunt Abby made it. I don't believe I can make the coffee, Miss Anderson. You can make it or go without, just as you please, says I. Ain't Aunt Abby gonna get up, says she. I guess she won't get up, says I, sick as she is. I was getting madder and madder. There was something about that little pink and white thing standing there and talking about coffee when she had killed so many better folks than she was and had just killed another that made me feel most as if I wish somebody would up and kill her before she had a chance to do any more harm. Is Aunt Abby sick? says Luella as if she was sort of aggrieved and injured. Yes, says I. She's sick and she's going to die. And then you'll be left alone. And you'll have to do for yourself and wait on yourself or do without things. I don't know, but I was sort of hard. But it was the truth. And if I was any harder than Luella Miller had been, I'll give up. I ain't never been sorry that I said it. Well, Luella, she up and had hysterics again at that. And I just let her have them. All I did was to bundle her into the room on the other side of the entry where Aunt Abby couldn't hear her. If she went past it, I don't know but what she was, and set her down hard on a chair and told her not to come back into the other room, and she minded. She had her hysterics in there till she got tired. When she found out that nobody was coming to coddle her and do for her, she stopped. At least I suppose she did. I had all I could do with poor Aunt Abby trying to keep the breath of life in her. The doctor had told me that she was dreadful low and gave me some very strong medicine to give her in drops real often and told me real particular about the nourishment. Well, I did as he told me, real faithful till she wasn't able to swallow any longer. Then I had her daughter sent for. I had begun to realize that she wouldn't last any time at all. I hadn't realized it before, though I spoke to Luella the way I did. The doctor, he came, and Mrs. Sam Abbott, but when she got there... It was too late. Her mother was dead. Aunt Abby's daughter just gave one look at her mother laying there. Then she turned sort of sharp and sudden and looked at me. Where is she? Says she, and I knew she meant Luella. She's out in the kitchen, says I. She's too nervous to see folks die. She's afraid it will make her sick. The doctor, he speaks up just then. He was a young man. Old Dr. Park had died the year before, and this was a young fella just out of college. Mrs. Miller is not strong, says he, kind of severe, and she's quite right in not agitating herself. 
You are another young man. She's got her pretty claws on you, thinks I. But I didn't say anything to him. I just said over to Miss Sam Abbott that Luella was in the kitchen, and Mrs. Sam Abbott, she went out there, and I went too, and I never heard anything like the way she talked to Luella Miller. I felt pretty hard to Luella myself, but this was more than I ever would have dared to say. Luella, she was too scared to go into hysterics. She just flopped. She seemed to just shrink away to nothing in that kitchen chair, with Mrs. Sam Abbott standing over her and talking and telling her the truth. I guess the truth was most too much for her, and no mistake, because Luella presently actually did faint away, and there weren't any sham about it, the way I always suspected there was about them hysterics. She fainted dead away, and we had to lay her flat on the floor, and the doctor, he came running out, and he said something about a weak heart, dreadful fierce to Mrs. Sam Abbott, but she weren't a mite scared. She faced him just as white as even Luella was laying there looking like death, and the doctor feeling of her pulse. Weak heart, says she. Weak heart, weak fiddlesticks. There ain't nothing weak about that woman. She's got strength enough to hang on to other folks till she kills them. Weak? It was my poor mother that was weak. This woman killed her as sure as if she had taken a knife to her. But the doctor, he didn't pay much attention. He was bending over Luella, laying there with her yellow hair all streaming, and her pretty pink and white face all pale, and her blue eyes like stars gone out. And he was holding onto her hand and smoothing her forehead, and telling me to get the brandy in Aunt Abby's room, and I was sure as I wanted to be that Luella had got somebody else to hang on to, now that Aunt Abby was gone. And I thought of poor Erastus Miller, and I sort of pitied the poor young doctor, led away by a pretty face, and I made up my mind I'd see what I could do. I waited till Aunt Abby had been dead and buried about a month, and the doctor was going to see Luella stay, and folks were beginning to talk. Then one evening, when I knew the doctor had been called out of town and wouldn't be round, I went over to Luella's. I found her all dressed up in a blue muslin with white polka dots on it, and her hair curled just as pretty, and there weren't a young girl in the place could compare with her. There was something about Luella Miller seemed to draw the heart right out of you, but she didn't draw it out of me. She was settin', rockin' in the chair by her sitting room window, and Mariah Brown had gone home. Maria Brown had been in to help her, or rather, to do the work, for Luella wa'n't helped when she didn't do anything. Maria Brown was real capable, and she didn't have any ties. She wa'n't married and lived alone, so she'd offered. I couldn't see why she should do the work any more than Luella. She wa'n't any too strong, but she seemed to think she could, and Luella seemed to think so too. So she went over and did all the work, washed and ironed and baked, while Luella sat and rocked. Mariah didn't live long afterward. She began to fade away just the same fashion the others had. Well, she was warned, but she acted real mad when folks said anything. Said Luella was a poor, abused woman, too delicate to help herself, and they ought to be ashamed. And if she died helping them that couldn't help themselves, she would. And she did. I suppose Mariah's gone home, says I to Luella when I'd gone in and sat down opposite her. Yes, Mariah went half an hour ago after she'd got supper and washed the dishes, says Luella in her pretty way. I suppose she's got a lot of work to do in her own house tonight, says I, kind of bitter, but that was all thrown away on Luella Miller. It seemed to her right that other folks that weren't any better able than she was herself should wait on her, and she couldn't get it through her head that anybody should think it weren't right. Yes, says Luella, real sweet and pretty. Yes, she said she had to do her washing tonight. She's let go of it for a fortnight along of coming over here. Why don't she stay home and do her washing instead of coming over here and doing your work when you are just as well able and enough sight more so than she is to do it, says I. Then Luella, she looked at me like a baby who has a rattle shook at it. She sort of laughed as innocent as you please. <laughs> oh, I can't do the work myself, Miss Anderson, says she. I never did. Mariah has to do it. Then I spoke out. Has to do it, says I. Has to do it? She don't have to do it either. Mariah Brown has her own home and enough to live on. She ain't beholden to you to come over here and slave for you and kill herself. 
Luella. She just sat and stared at me for all the world like a doll baby that was so abused it was coming to life. Yes, says I, she's killing herself. She's going to die just the way Erastus did and Lily and your Aunt Abby. You're killing her just as you did them. I don't know what there is about you, but you seem to bring a curse, says I. You kill everybody that is fool enough to care anything about you and do for you. She stared at me and she was pretty pale. And Mariah ain't the only one you're going to kill, says I. You're going to kill Dr. Malcolm before you're done with him. Then a red color came flaming all over her face. I ain't going to kill him either, says she, and she began to cry. Yes, you be, says I. Then I spoke as I had never spoke before. You see, I felt it on account of Erastus. I told her that she hadn't any business to think of another man after she'd been married to one that had died for her. That she was a dreadful woman. And she was, that's true enough. But sometimes I have wondered lately if she knew it. If she weren't like a baby with scissors in its hand, cutting everybody without knowing what it was doing. Luella, she kept getting paler and paler, and she never took her eyes off my face. There was something awful about the way she looked at me and never spoke one word. After a while, I quit talking and I went home. I watched that night, but her lamp went out before nine o'clock, and when Dr. Malcolm come driving past and sort of slowed up, he see there weren't any light and he drove along. I saw her sort of shy out of meeting the next Sunday, too, so he shouldn't go home with her, and I began to think maybe she did have some, some conscience after all. It was only a week after that that Mariah Brown died, sort of sudden at the last, though everybody had seen it was coming. Well, then there was a good deal of feeling and pretty dark whispers. Folks said the days of witchcraft had come again, and they were pretty shy of Luella. She acted sort of offish to the doctor, and he didn't go there, and there weren't anybody to do anything for her. I don't know how she did get along. I wouldn't go in there and offer to help her, not because I was afraid of dying like the rest, but I thought she was just as well able to do her own work as I was to do it for her. And I thought it was about time that she did it and stopped killing other folks. But it weren't very long before folks began to say that Luella herself was going into a decline, just the way her husband and Lily and Aunt Abby and the others had. And I saw myself that she looked pretty bad. I used to see her going past from the store with a bundle as if she could hardly crawl. But I remembered how Erastus used to wait and tend when he couldn't hardly put one foot before the other, and I didn't go out to help her. But at last, one afternoon, I saw the doctor come driving up like mad with his medicine chest, and Mrs. Babbitt come in after supper and said that Luella was real sick. I'd offer to go in and nurse her, says she, but I've got my children to consider, and maybe it ain't true what they say, but it's queer how many folks that have done for her have died. I didn't say anything, but I considered how she'd been Erastus's wife, and how he had set his eyes by her, and I made up my mind to go in the next morning, unless she was better, and see what I could do. But the next morning I see her at the window, and pretty soon she came stepping out spry as you please. And a little while afterwards, Mrs. Babbitt came in and told me that the doctor had got a girl from out of town, a Sarah Jones, to come there. And she said she was pretty sure that the doctor was going to marry Luella. I saw him kiss her in the door that night myself, and I knew it was true. The woman came that afternoon, and the way she flew around was a caution. I don't believe Luella had swept since Mariah died. She swept and dusted and washed and ironed. Wet clothes and dusters and carpets were flying over there all day. And every time Luella set her foot out when the doctor went there, there was that Sarah Jones helping of her up and down the steps as if she hadn't learned to walk. Well, everybody knew that Luella and the doctor were going to be married, but it weren't long before they began to talk about his looking so poorly, just as they had about the others. And they talked about Sarah Jones, too. Well, the doctor did die. And he wanted to be married first, so as to leave what little he had to Luella. But he died before the minister could get there, and Sarah Jones died a week afterward. Well, that wound up everything for Luella Miller. Not another soul in the whole town would lift a finger for her. There got to be a sort of panic. Then she began to droop in good earnest. 
She used to have to go to the store herself, and Mrs. Babbitt was afraid to let Tommy go for her. And I've seen her going past and stopping every two, three steps to rest. Well, I stood it as long as I could, but one day I see her coming with her arms full and stopping to lean against the Babbitt fence, and I run out and took her bundles and carried them to her house. Then I went home and never spoke one word to her, though she called after me, dreadful kind of pitiful. Well, that night I was taken sick with a chill, and I was so sick as I wanted to be for two weeks. Mrs. Babbitt had seen me run out to help Luella, and she came in and told me I was going to die on account of it. I didn't know whether I was or not, but I considered I had done right by Erastus's wife. That last two weeks, Luella, she had a dreadful hard time, I guess. She was pretty sick, and as near as I could make out, nobody dared to go near her. I don't know if she was really needing anything very much, for there was enough to eat in her house, and it was warm weather, and she made out to cook a little flour gruel every day, I know. But I guess she had a hard time, she that had been so petted and done for all her life. When I got so I could go out, I went over there one morning. Mrs. Babbitt had just come in to say that she hadn't seen any smoke, and she didn't know but it was somebody's duty to go in, but she couldn't help thinking of her children. And I got right up, though I hadn't been out the house for two weeks, and I went in there, and Luella, she was laying on the bed, and she was dying. She lasted all that day and into the night, but I sat there after the new doctor had gone away. Nobody else dared to go there. It was about midnight that I left her for a minute to run home and get some medicine I'd been taking, for I had begun to feel rather bad. It was a full moon that night, and just as I started out of my door to cross the street back to Luella's, I stopped short, for I saw something. Lydia Anderson, at this juncture, always said with a certain defiance that she did not expect to be believed, and then proceeded in a hushed voice. I saw what I saw, and I know I saw it, and I will swear on my deathbed that I saw it. I saw Luella Miller, and Erastus Miller, and Lily, and Aunt Abby, and Mariah, and the doctor, and Sarah all going out of her door, and all but Luella shone white in the moonlight, and they were all helping her along till she seemed to fairly fly in the midst of them. Then it all disappeared. I stood a minute with my heart pounding. Then I went over there. I thought of going for Mrs. Babbitt, but I thought she'd be afraid. So I went alone, though I knew what had happened. Luella was laying real peaceful, dead on her bed. This was the story that the old woman, Lydia Anderson, told. But the sequel was told by people who survived her, and this is the tale which has become folklore in the village. Lydia Anderson died when she was 87. She had continued wonderfully hale and hearty for one of her years, until about two weeks before her death. One bright moonlight evening she was sitting beside a window in her parlor when she made a sudden exclamation and was out of the house and across the street before the neighbor who was taking care of her could stop her. She followed as fast as possible and found Lydia Anderson stretched on the ground before the door of Luella Miller's deserted house, and she was quite dead. The next night there was a red gleam of fire athwart the moonlight, and the old house of Luella Miller was burned to the ground. Nothing is now left of it except a few old cellar stones and a lilac bush, and in summer a helpless trail of morning glories among the weeds which might be considered emblematic of Luella herself. Once again, we must sign off to go our separate ways. But we'll be here again next month. Let's call it a date. Today's story, Luella Miller, was written by Mary E. Wilkins Freeman and published in Everybody's Magazine in December 1902. This performance was done by Julie Hoverson, sound and mastering by Julie Hoverson. The music was from amclassical.com.
the opening and closing credits used the music of The Entertainer by Scott Joplin, available through amclassical.com, and the opening voices included Glenn Hallstrom, Tanya Milajevic, Gwendolyn Jensen Woodard, Lothar Tuppen, Julie Hoverson, and Carrie Ayers. Russell Gold was the announcer. This is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike Non-Commercial Clauses. Feel free to pass it around, but don't try to make money on it. This is copyright 2011 to Julie Hoverson and Reality Productions.